Some of you were here last week, some of you were not. And I'm going to continue this thought that we started last week in our Repairing the Breach series. Now, I will have to admit, I did not think this Repairing the Breach series would go up into past Memorial Day. Every year, the Lord gives us a theme, and I pray the last month of the year, Lord, what's your direction for 20, or well, the, the new year this year, 2024, what's your direction? And every year, the Lord downloads things in my spirit that he wants me to touch on really it's kind of our vision it's our mission for the year well this year the, the Lord spoke to me in December about the topic of repairing the breach and that this year would be a year for us individually to inspect our walk with the Lord and find out if there's any breaches in the wall of our walk with the Lord but also as a church family so we're not just looking at this individually, but we're looking at this as a church family to go through ministries or areas of our church that I think need to be repaired. And, and we've covered a lot of deep subjects. If you've missed any of these, I encourage you to go on our YouTube channel and catch one of these uh, messages that I've already ministered to. But last week, let's go ahead and put this up here. Um, Susan, we, we talked about Pentecost. Now, um, it's, it's funny because last week was Pentecost, and as I began the week, the week before, I was like, Lord, it's Pentecost Sunday, so what do you want me to minister on? And the Lord began to deal with me about the subject of unity, and the more and more I worked on the message, the Lord was like, well, that's a breach. Disunity is a breach in our walk with the Lord and in the church. So last week, we started talking about Pentecost banding together as a unified church. And I'm just going to lead up to where we find ourselves today. So the first point was the secret has been obvious the whole time. This is what's amazing. On Monday, as I was going on my prayer drive, now there's a pastor friend of mine who's a retired pastor. He lives in the South. And uh, I, I keep in touch with him regularly just to check up on him and see how he's doing. He called me over the weekend and left a message. Hey, I need you to call me and uh, let's catch up. So I called him on Monday and he said, oh, he said, Dennis, you got to hear this revelation the Lord's given me. And I said, what? He said, man, I'm telling you, I, it's as deep, it's deep. I said, come on, pour it on me. Tell me this revelation. He said, in Acts chapter 2, when they were with one heart and one mind and one accord, he said, the lesson of unity. He said, I believe the body of Christ needs to hear about unity. And I'm just listening to him. And, and I said, brother, you preaching my message. I said, I just preached on this yesterday. And he's rejoicing on the phone. And of course, we're comparing. And so I know that this is something the Holy Spirit's wanting to minister to the body of Christ. I really believe, not just here, but I believe, I believe around the nation, really around the world. So that's confirmation from three states away that the Lord is doing this. And he's trying to get his church back unified and so we we began with this lesson last week we only got through two about the secret's been obvious the whole time what's that mean the secret to power the secret to the anointing the secret to our church doing a great work for the kingdom it's unity so we laid the groundwork last week and then we went on and we talked about what one accord means in Acts chapter 2. In the Greek it means of the same mind or spirit to be in harmony several beings moving forward gracefully. And then let's put this next slide up. And, then, and so we moved on. We talked about in order to fellowship or to participate with what the Spirit is doing, it will involve how well we work with others. I know that wasn't too popular for me to say that, but church is all about people. Church is not about you coming and getting your blessing and receiving from the worship. It's engaging in worship. It's being a blessing to those that are receiving or getting prayer. It's more than you just getting your blessing and hearing from the message. Praise the Lord. God is trying to get a message across to you right now. So you better listen. Thank you, Lord, for that confirmation. Amen. You better wake up today. God's got something to say. Woo! Hallelujah. Just keep the power on for about another hour, Lord. Amen. Flowing in the Spirit doesn't happen without flowing in unity with others. We need to get this down. I, I'll reiterate it as I, as I jump into this today. Church is all about people. Church is not a place that you just kind of visit every once in a while and you get your blessing and you go. No, it's about those you worship with. It's about doing ministry together. It's struggling together, worshiping together, sweating together, crying together, bleeding together. That's what church, and it's going to have to happen with you interacting with other people. 
There's no rogue ministries in the body of Christ. Let's go ahead and put this next slide up. So we ended with this. Unity releases God's power and favor. And so we went through Acts 2. And then we ended last week with Psalm 133. And I didn't really dissect the verse. I just kind of read it toward the close. And it talks about how the Lord commands a blessing when we choose to walk in unity. Well, let's put this next slide up here. This is what I want to talk about today. Can unity be a reality or is it just a dream? Now listen, I, next Sunday, I celebrate 30 years of being a senior pastor. Next Sunday. The first Sunday of June in 1994, while I was in children's church, I started pastoring my first church. Anyway, some of you didn't get that. See, children's, anyway. <laughs> giving away my age here. 30 years. One of the biggest challenges I've ever faced as a pastor is to try to get a congregation unified. Now, as we begin this today, before I jump into this, I want to I wanna preface what I'm getting ready to say with, with a couple of different key lessons that we need to realize, okay? I want to interject a couple of important things that we cannot misunderstand about the topic of unity in the church. Let's put this slide up here. Tony Evans said, unity is not uniformity. Unity is oneness of purpose. So when we talk about uniformity, sometimes we misunderstand. While we must be united on what God's Word teaches, we must be united on how we go about doing church, we must be united when it comes to the Word, we must be united into what we believe, we must be united in the direction that the Holy Spirit is trying to take us as a church. Unity is not uniformity. Now, I put a definition of uniformity up here just to get us to understand a little bit about what I'm talking about. Uniformity is defined as sameness in style or a condition where everything is unvarying. A lack of diversity, sameness. And now this is the definite to the point of boredom. So when you hear me talk about uniformity, okay, which unity is not. It, 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 everybody at church looks together. It looks the same. And, and, and everybody on the worship team looks the same. There's no diversity in the church. We're not letting people express the gifting that God's given to them or the characteristics that the Lord has given to them. That would make church awfully boring if there was uniformity, right? Uh, that would be very religious. That would be very rigid. So that's not what I'm talking about when I talk about uniformity. A, con a sameness in style, condition where everything is unvarying, a lack of diversity, sameness to the point. Of look around the sanctuary. Now I know we got a lot of people that are just out for Memorial Day, but just look around the sanctuary. Aren't you glad we've got some diversity here in the church? Amen. The diversity of color, diversity of background, diversity of testimony, d diversity of gifting, diversity of all shapes and sizes. Amen. Well, listen, we've got diversity here at the Terra Church of God, and it's our diversity that is our strength. Because that's how on the day of Pentecost they were able to come together is they all spoke with, with, with tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. And when they came out of the upper room, people from those nations were like, hey, I hear them speaking my language. And the Lord was able to bring that together, the uniqueness of everybody in that upper room. When they were walking in unity, it was displayed and the world got to see it. So unity is not uniformity. But also the next thing I want to touch on, and, and hold on to your seatbelts. I, I got to throw this out here. Let's put this next slide up here. Just, just kind of laying the groundwork. Is unity is not, how do I word this? We don't compromise truth. We don't compromise the word. We don't compromise conviction just to keep the peace or maintain unity. So when you hear me talking about unity, I'm not talking about that either. Some of you have been in church long enough that you've seen this happen. That some churches just to keep the peace. Now we don't, we don't preach on that subject here. Because we might ruffle the biggest tither's feathers. Or we might make you know a family mad and they're related to other families and they're friends with that and if you make them mad they're all going to get mad and they're all so we don't so that's not what i'm talking about i'm not talking about the world trying to inject things from the culture and saying the church come on if you want to be unified you need to embrace 
these new teachings. You need to embrace these new lifestyles. You need to embrace these things because, come on, as the body of Christ, it's all about unity. Listen, there's one way to heaven, and it's Jesus. I'm not going to embrace another faith or another religion under the umbrella of what God's doing here. Amen. That will never happen. So that's not what I'm talking about when I talk about maintaining. I'm not going to compromise the truth of God's word just because I'm afraid that I might offend somebody. That's not unity. So I mean, you know what I'm talking about. So unity is not uniformity. And also unity is not me compromising truth or compromising the word or compromising conviction. Just, just, to, keep, just to keep the peace. So can unity be a reality or is it just a dream? Now, last week we laid the groundwork. We established that unity was on display on the day of Pentecost. It was that atmosphere that birthed the church. And it's what sent out the early church filled with the Holy Spirit. We took Philippians chapter 2 and Ephesians 4. We cross-referenced them and showed specific instructions that were given to the church by God himself on how the Lord commands us to walk in unity, function in unity, and endeavor to keep the unity of, of the faith. Well, today I'm going to pick up where I left off last week, and I want to talk about what happened right after Pentecost. So we ended last week, and we finally talked about what happened in Acts 2. But let's talk about what happened in Acts 4. Let's put this scripture up here. So in Acts chapter 2, they were in unity. They were in unity for 10 days in that upper room. They came out of the upper room, filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Peter preached the first message ever recorded in the New Testament. 3,000 souls were added to the church. In Acts chapter 3, they were walking in such unity that Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer and saw a lame man laying by the gate called Beautiful, seeking alms. Peter and John looked at him, fastened their eyes on him, the Bible says. And they said, silver and gold have we none, but in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And the Bible says that that lame man leaped to his feet and God performed a miracle. See, do you see the outflow of what happens when we're walking in unity? Oh, I'm headed somewhere. And so they were persecuted for doing this. The Bible says that that lame man went into, and everybody knew who he was because he laid at the gate every day. All the priests, all the Pharisees, all the religious people walked right past him every day. They knew who he was. So they needed to shut the church up because all of a sudden now a notable miracle, it says, had been done. Now everybody's going to start talking about Jesus. So the religious leaders tried to shut the church up. So they threatened Peter and John. They threatened the early church. And they said, don't you dare preach the name of Jesus anymore because people are, people are going to listen to your message. And they said, man, we, we can't deny the fact that a miracle had, had taken place. And so this is where we find ourselves in Acts chapter 4. They'd been persecuted. And the church prayed for them. And the Bible says, after all that persecution, with great power, gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Now, in order for us to really understand what this portion of Scripture says, we need to understand what the word grace means. Let's put this up here. So a lot of times we look at the word grace and we think it's unmerited favor. You know, I, I, I don't deserve salvation, and God, by His grace, accepted me when I repented. That is one definition. But when you look up this definition in the Greek, this is what the definition is, okay? Remember, when you're studying the Bible, you've got to look at it in context. Sometimes you see the same word, and in one portion of Scripture, the definition might be a little bit different, okay? So grace is one of those words a lot of times when people see that word grace, they just think it's God's big eraser. And all of a sudden, you can live however you want because you're under grace. You're, and that's not what it means. So grace is unmerited favor. God does love me despite my past. But, but here in Acts 4, the definition of grace, it's the same one in, in Romans chapter 12. It's the same one in, in 1 Corinthians. It's the same one when it pertains to the miraculous. 
So a lot of times people don't understand that grace is really the power of God working in us, doing things that we normally couldn't do in the natural. It, 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 it is a grace gift for us to lay hands on the sick. It is a grace gift to cast out devils and to walk in authority. In our own strength, we don't have it, but the Lord gives us. What is it? He gives divine influence on the heart. For, for me to stand, at, even after 30 years of being a senior pastor, I can't stand up here and minister the word every week without the grace of God. Now, I can get up in the natural and I could, you know, spit shine my message every week and think, wow, man, this thing's, this is awesome, man. This is, a, and, and in the natural, think I'm going to stand up here and minister the word in the natural, in the, I can't do it. Now, if I try to do it, I'll fall flat on my face. And, and even this morning when I was praying, I, I, I'm, I'm just sharing a little bit of my private life. This morning, I said, Lord, I can't preach this message by myself. I can't, I can't do this in my own strength because without you, I'm absolutely nothing. I am only who I am because of, of who you are. Yet there are certain things in our life, if we choose to do, that releases the grace that's been given to us. Are you keeping up with me? So this grace was given to them because they were walking in unity. And so what this teaches me is, is that if I'm not walking in unity, God doesn't release the fullness of his grace on me to carry out what he's called me to do. Are y'all with me? So great, it's divine influence upon the heart. Also, it's favor. So the Lord brought favor to the early church that even though they were persecuted, they still was able to walk with their needs being met. Hallelujah. Even though they were persecuted, they were still able to meet and to pray. And God still grew the church in the midst of prayer. That's favor. So God gave them favor. It is a benefit. It is a gift. And remember, we don't earn the gifts. We resign ourselves over to the Lord, and then he gives the gift. Amen. It is joy. It is rejo All these things were present in the early church. Matter of fact, in this portion of Scripture... They rejoiced that they were even found worthy to suffer persecution for the sake of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I mean, could you imagine if that's how our attitude was today in today's church? That we were persecuted and instead of whining and crying about it, we would sit back and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you that I was whipped. Thank you that I was thrown in prison. Thank you that I was spit upon. Thank you that I was ridiculed and I would, because I was found worthy to be persecuted for the cost of Christ. Hallelujah. Are you getting this? But see, God will give you grace in those situations. He'll give you strength. He'll allow you to rejoice. He'll allow you to still be cheerful even though you're going through a trial because you're carrying out what the Lord's called you to do. See, this is something that I've realized through the years. It is, you know, it's, it's crazy because I'll talk to some people. Some people are like, man, you're crazy being a pastor. I can never do what you do. It's because that's not your grace. We can look at Lorraine and say, man, I can, I can never do what you do because that's not your grace. Are you getting that? You look at Michelle over next door doing the children's church, and you're like, man, I, man, I, man, I babysit my grandkids, and after 10 minutes, I'm sending them back home to the parents, right? Because I can't. I love them, but Jesus... And she's, listen, she deals with your children every week through my long sermons. When the Holy Ghost is moving, she's dealing with your children. Listen, and some of you are like, I can't do that. No, you can't because that's not your grace. Amen. Amen. Are, you, are you getting this? And so whatever we do for the Lord, God gives us the grace to accomplish it. But the key to releasing that grace the key to releasing that gift, joy to do it, rejoicing in the midst of it, cheerfulness, divine gratuity, the, 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 what releases it is me walking in unity. Amen. Oh, I'm going to prove that. You know me. I'm gonna cross, we're going to prove this today. Gratuity, okay? Some of you are like, God tips his people? What? what? Well, in a, in a, listen to, listen, stay in the light. In a way, that's kind of... It is something given without demand. So I want you to get this. Oh, this is, this is awesome. When, when we're walking in unity, oh, hear what I'm saying when I say this. I, I, ministry's easy. Oh, hear what I'm saying? 
don't, don't, don't misquote me. It, it, it's a whole lot easier to let the Holy Ghost do what he needs to do through you than to try to do it in your own strength. Um, listen, it only happens through unity. And we need to get that down. A unified church is a powerful church. A unified church is a rejoicing church, a cheerful church. It, it is a church that understands God will give me something without me having to beg or demand for it. He'll just give it. Because I've been faithful in the little. I've been a good steward with what he's given me to do for the kingdom. And as a good steward, I chose to walk in unity. I chose to forgive. I chose to not hold on to offense. I chose to submit to those over me in the Lord. I chose to worship without wrath or doubting. I chose to do those things. And as a result, the Lord, he, he just gives me things without me even asking. Are you getting this? It's right here. It is spiritual endowment. It is miraculous faculty. This is what I love. It is miraculous faculty. And that's what the early church demonstrated in Acts chapter 3. A notable miracle was done. The Lord gave them the grace to call out that layman and say, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And he did. It is an ability acquired for a particular kind of action, power, or aptitude. Oh, church, you, you, you got to get this today. Please listen to me. Unity brings God's grace, but God's grace brings favor. It brings gifts. It brings joy. It brings rejoicing. It brings cheerfulness. It brings spiritual endowment, and it brings miraculous faculty. Let's put this next. I'll prove it in the Old Testament in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. It says that when it came to pass, when the priests had come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified, and they didn't wait by course, look at this next verse. All the Levites, which were the singers, and all of those as Asaph of, of Heman and, and Judith, and with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them 120. It sound like, no, sounds a little familiar to me. 120, 120 on the day of Pentecost, 120 on this day. I want you to see what happens when we choose to come together, and the Lord is the focal point of our worship. He's the focal point of our ministry, and we're willing to do things God's way. Look at the next verse. This is what happened. It came to pass when the trumpeteers and the singers were as what? One. They were, they were in one accord. That's the definition I gave, reiterated as we began the message today. When they were one to make one sound. Now, here you've got, you've got drums, you've got cymbals, you've got harps. But one sound, yeah. Their heart was in unity. Their mind was in unity. Their spirit was in unity. Their focus was in unity. When they came together and made some beautiful music before the Lord. And guess what happens? When they lifted their voice with the trumpets of the cymbals and the instruments of music. And they praised the Lord saying, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. The house was filled with a cloud. Even the house of the Lord. The Lord gave them a grace. The Lord manifested his glory in the form of a cloud. And it only happened when they chose to get to a place of unity. So why do you think the enemy's trying to fight the unity of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ so bad? Because he understands what happens when we all endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. He understands what happens when we choose to come together. It is all through Scripture, church family. When we walk in unity, God shows up. When we walk in unity, amazing things happen in our worship. As a matter of fact, it releases the fullness of the giftings in the church. Look at Romans chapter 12. Are y'all getting this today? So one of the things, one of my goals for 2024 and beyond. I'm part of a pastor's forum and a seasoned pastor. He's an overseer now. It's a church of God pastor's forum. He said, what age do you think you hit your peak in ministry? What lessons have you learned through the years? I came in and I said, well, in my, in my 20s, I knew nothing and was immature. 
In my 30s, I was proud. In my 40s, I went through brokenness. And I said, now at 54, I think, I think I'm getting to that season where I, I finally get it. And what I'm getting is this. We cannot operate as a church until, one, we get in unity. But two, I know the grace on your life and the gifting God has for you, and you fully release that gift in the church. Amen. See, let me back that up. How many of you hear my heart beat in this? See, we, we've got to erase old mindsets of what we thought church was in order to understand what the word says church really is. What's happened is over the last four years since, since the pandemic, and I'm watching a, a documentary about it right now, about the effect that the pandemic had on the church. And they're interviewing some pastors that didn't shut down. And they said, no, God's authority is above man's authority. And when they were meeting, they talked about the meetings as leaders and the discussions they were having. And they were talking about the repercussions of what this was going to do to the church now that people were no longer able to gather. And in that documentary they were talking about, they, they said, you know, the church is, is in, in this church, they've really incorporated a great model of what church is. Raising up leaders, equipping leaders, letting people use their gifts and understanding all those things. And, but one of the things that the pandemic revealed <laughs> was really what our view of the church is. Because what happened is when you started having an online church, and for some people, they're willing to trade online church with church in person. For them, that's an, that's an okay trade. And there's a lot of people, and I'm telling a huge percentage of people that have never come back since the pandemic. They got so used to watching church online, and that's all you hear now. Well, I know I'm not going to be there, but I'll watch online. Well, I know I got other things going on. I know I got other things on my schedule that I want to say, but I'll watch it online. And what happened is the church is now not coming together as the koinonia, as the fellowship. They're not coming together anymore and practicing what the early church practiced. The Bible says the early church daily prayed together and broke bread from house to house. Daily. The Bible says that the early church, now I know it's not a command, sold everything and gave it to the they took all all their land everything they sold and they gave it to the church and they said we're just now beginning as a church and we know we need the finances to do this and so they brought the money to the feet of the to the apostles and said distribute it to the church as needed that that was their approach their approach was fellowship communion together washing the saints feet and it was also learning their gifting as the church matured through the book of Acts and finally got later on after the apostle Paul was put over the church, he gave instructions in First and Second Corinthians. He's starting to give instructions about the gifts and he's letting all of us in here know that if we don't realize church isn't about me, but it's about you releasing whatever your gifting is to benefit the others you worship with, you don't really understand what church is about. Why is it quiet in here? So what happened with online church, what happened through the pandemic, is now the church became consumers. Now, now the church became the big show and the watchers were the audience. And instead of engaging, partnering with what the Holy Spirit is doing and saying, hey, if the church falls, I fall with it. If the church rises, I rise with it. I have a part to play. I'm part of the body. Come on, hello. Hello. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I'm part of the body. And one of the things that I'm wanting to do, and so I'm finally getting that, I think our church is at this place, is I want everybody to find their place of belonging in the Terre Haute Church of God. I, I, I want to shift past a culture of consumerism. I, I want to shift past a church culture of I just come to get my blessing and leave. No, 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 no. Stop. We need to be in unity. And part of that unity is you saying, I'm more than just attendee. I'm more than just somebody who comes in and sits on the seat and says, I dare you to bless me. <laughs> I'm going to sit on this seat and the worship team better bring it this week. I'm going to sit on that seat and the pastor better bring it this week. No, 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 no. Remove, erase that off the board. Remove that from your mindset of what you think church is. Because that ain't the church I read about in the book of Acts. That's not the church I read about in Scripture. 
The, the church I read about in Scripture is a unified body of everybody understanding whether my gift is seen or not seen, whether it's big or small. It doesn't matter. I contribute the grace God gave me to the rest of the body so we can grow together and function together. Come on, is this making any sense? And one of my goals, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the long, at least I've been here 23 years, I, I, and I get it, this church has been through difficult seasons, trying seasons, and we haven't been able to always do this. It, to everything, there's a, but I think we're here now. I, th- I, think, I think we're at a place now that we can raise up some more leaders in the church, that we can raise up some more teachers, that we can raise up some more department heads, we can raise up some elders in the church to help spread the the ministry from just being on my shoulders or Pastor Adam's shoulders and help elongate the arms of ministry. Come on. And just like when Moses got tired and and Aaron and her got underneath and they lifted up the arms of Moses, when the staff went down, they were losing in battle and they said, no, 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 no. We need to lift the hands of our leader. And they came and they showed what unity is all about. And when his arms were tired and they lifted them up, they went on to victory. It's for every one of you saying from week to week, I need to serve somewhere. If it's just a greeter, if it's just an usher, if it's work, working my turn in the preschool or nursery or, spli- or being on the security team or, or helping with even things during the week, okay? Even things during the week that nobody gets the glory, nobody gets the honor, no selfie, you know. On, look at me doing, <laughs> fed the homeless this week. No, don't take a picture. You don't need a picture of that. You find somewhere where you belong. Because imagine, church family, if everybody in this church, everybody, found the grace that was given to them. For I say unto you, through the grace given unto me, that every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Next verse. Are y'all keeping up with me today? Are you hearing my heart? For we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, have not the same gifting, have not the same anointing. Verse 5, and I think we're going to read to verse 8. So we, the Terre Haute Church of God, being many, right, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. My wife said it great when, she, when we presented everything to our graduates this year. These are our kids. Oh, come on. No, 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 no. You got to hear me. You, you got to change your mind. You, you got to change your approach to doing church. These teenagers that stood up here are more than just the child of somebody who attends here. They, they, listen, Ty, Ty, is Taiwan here? He was here since he was a little boy. Sunday school teachers 10 years ago taught him on Wednesday. Seed that they planted into him when he was a younger boy is still in there in his spirit somewhere. Because somebody said, I don't know who this child is. I might not know where they came from, but I'm going to get to know who they are and I'm going to invest in their life because we're in this thing together. Am I making some sense? So these teenagers that stood before you today is more than just somebody else's kid. They're your children. That when you see them come to church and you see them come to this altar and we see it every week, all of our young people, listen, what you're seeing here isn't happening everywhere. I would rather have our church kids up here doing this than back in the corner scrolling, hanging out. Well, the security team would run them out. Amen. In the bathroom, the whole church service. They're your children. And they need you. That ministry needs you. Those children need you. Sunday school needs you. Wednesday needs you. And when Mama Shell comes before this church like she does every year and shows you that jar of marbles, 
And every marble represents one day. And she talks about how many days we've got with them. The day comes that they move on. There are kids. We do have a stake in this. We do have a part. So we got to change our mindset. We can't walk into the church and say, that's none of my business. Now, I, now listen, that's a future. That's, I got it right here in my notes. I ain't going to get to it today, so it's okay. <laughs> I'm not talking about being nosy know-it-alls. Okay, that's not what I'm, But I'm saying it is your bit. When you walk into the church, you find some trash on the floor. It is your, hey, this is my church. I'm going to pick up that piece of trash. That's my church. I want it to look good. I don't want visitors coming into this church and seeing trash all over the floor. I'm going to help pick that up. You see a single mom or a single dad come into this church with their children. They're having a hard time getting them situated and where they're so. Why don't you come up alongside them and say, hey, do you need my help? Hey, do you need me to walk one of the kids over next door to children? Do you need me to take them down to the class? Because see, what it does is it shifts all of that weight off of this man's shoulders on all the things he does on a weekly basis, and it helps elongate the ministry of our church so we can now do it more with excellence because everybody finds, listen, I don't care who you are. You might sit back and say, I can't sing. I can't teach. I can't preach. I have nothing to offer. Yes, you do. You have something to, God didn't create you without giving you a grace and placing you as a member of the body of Christ to do something for the kingdom. All of you have something to offer. All of you have something. We got some great cooks in this church. And some of them's going to work the cafeteria for youth camp this summer. That's a, listen, that is awesome. Read the next verse. Are you getting this? This is where we're headed. And I guarantee you, when we get this, and not just me, you get it. This wall is going to be knocked down sooner than later. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and God will bring the funds in to do it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I'm you, every church, every pastor I've ever followed through the years that I've respected, I've watched their ministry, and you see an explosion of growth, they, they get this secret right here. Right here. This is what they get. Amen. Not backbiting and dissension and gossip and all that stuff. Unity. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of that. See, there's that word grace. He uses the word grace. What is that? It's the same definition of Acts chapter 4, when great grace was on the church. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Verse 7. Or ministry, let us wait on our minister. Or he that teach on teaching. Verse 8. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do with simplicity. He that rules with diligence, he that shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, a lot of times we don't really even consider these gifts. We think of the office gifts of Ephesians, the fivefold ministry. We think of the nine manifestation gifts of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But a lot of times we don't think of these gifts here in Romans. These are also, these are, now I know a lot of people call them the motivational gifts or the grace gifts. They give them different titles. But these are gifts. These are the ones we overlook. Because some of you, the Lord has just given you the gift of giving. You see that? Can't sing, can't teach. Man, there's a lot. But I can give. I'm a giver. How about exhortation? What's exhortation? Somebody that's able to encourage, to exhort. Some of you in here are encouragers. You're needed in the body. He that rules, that means somebody that has a leadership gifting in their life. They just, in your own private life, maybe you're a business owner, or maybe the position you have on your job, that you've got people underneath you, and the Lord just wired you that way. That's just how you see things. You see things differently. You can organize. You can structure. And, and all of us have these. Am I making any sense? Come on. I know I'm on it down here in a second, but this is some good stuff. Amen. Now, before I reach this final point, I want you to hear me. We get to this place when we're in unity. If we're not at this place individually, because you've got to understand, 
We do a great job criticizing what the church isn't doing. But we need to look in the mirror and say, what part of my plan? You've got to understand the Terre Haute Church of God consists of everybody that attends it. So imagine, imagine, okay? Imagine whether you were a sports team. Well, let's use a sports team. I mean, I could use a military example. I could use a business. But imagine if the 2080, which is kind of the universal you know, figure that's used, 20% do 80% of the work. Imagine if a sports team, you know, you got five people out on a basketball court, you got nine people out on a baseball field. And you, how many's on a football field? Come on. Tell me. Huh? Football player. How many people are on a football field? Um, both teams or just, one? just one? Eleven. Eleven? Now imagine, he's, he was a defensive player. So imagine, imagine they got 11 people coming out on the offense and only four people came out on defense. Come on. Come on now, Bishop. Only four. Come on. How many games do you think they'd win that year? How easy do you think it would be for the opponent to score a touchdown every time when they got 11 people out there and they only got four? Are y'all listening? Now, that's what happens to a church when more than half the people are just sitting, receiving, get my blessing and go home and forget about what goes on during the week. Until you get this, until we get this. Now, I get it. This is, a, I, this is a miracle. And I understand if every church was able to get this, we'd win the world in a week. The Bible says the early church turned the world upside down with a ragtag team of uneducated fishermen and carpenters. They, listen, they turned the world upside down. Why? Because God gave them a grace, an empowerment to grow the church. In Acts chapter 2, they grew by 3,000. Just a few chapters later, another 5,000. And then later on in Acts chapter 6, 7, and 8, they were growing so big, the disciples said, we, don't, we, we, we can't wait the tape. We got to appoint some people to do, because we need to devote ourselves to study in the Word and leading. We need some more people on board. So the church faced this problem as we do today. But everybody was in such unity. Hear me. In such unity. Does see it come to pass? Amen. They brought the resources together. They faced the challenge together. Let me close with this thought. Unity is such a command from God. It is so important to God. Romans 16, 17 says this. We'll close with this. I made it through my introduction today. Praise the Lord. We'll continue it next week. <laughs> Guilt is charged. Now, we read portions of Scripture like this. These are the portions like we rip out of our Bible. Oh, it's all about love. It's all about unity. Just compromise. Just let it slide. God says, unity is so important to me. You mark those that cause division and offenses. I didn't say it. I'm just the messenger. You're going to get mad at anybody? Don't get mad at me. You get mad at God. So the church has already established itself. This is Romans chapter 16. A few decades have went by since Acts chapter 2 at this point. And God saw his church and he noticed that there were people coming in and quarreling and causing trouble and people thought that they were obeying the lord by doing these things and and the lord said no 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 you don't do this i'm not going to let this disunity harm the church and he says you mark those that cause offenses and divisions and avoid them i didn't say it now when you break this down let's put this up here i told you this is it my last scripture Let's put this slide up here, Susan. This is what it means. Now, this is the Greek. Now, listen, I'm not saying hate. I'm not, I'm not saying you, you, you got to read the context, okay? And rightly divide the word. 
Now, we're supposed to love our enemies. We're supposed to pray for those that despitefully use us. And I, I, we're supposed to continue to do that. But God says when it comes to the ministry of the church. Now, some of you, when you read where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am the midst, you don't realize that the other verses around that, it, it is a chapter talking about people needing to repent. And, and Jesus said, if somebody sins, you go, to the, you go to them alone. If they refuse to repent, you bring a witness with them. If they refuse to repent with the witness, you bring someone else, and where two or three are gathered, I'm there. So this is what the Lord is saying. I'm going to carry out whatever leadership issue needs to be dealt with here. My authority will empower the leaders of the church to carry out what needs to be done. When you... T- Are y'all still here with me? Some of you are like, oh my Jesus, he went there today, didn't he? (laughs) Listen, if we're going to talk about unity, we better talk about all it says. And if we're going to talk about unity, we've got to talk about the flip side. And we're going to talk about what God God says to do with those that are causing disunity. He says, mark those. Mark means take heed, take aim, and take notice. You don't hate. But you need to understand I'm not going to allow them to to let that poison in me. They want to come to me and talk about something? Not me. Because what God's doing in this church is too important. Because I'm telling you, the enemy finds a breach in the wall. All it takes is one offended person. That's all they just one offended person. Because people that are offended don't want to be solo. They got to get other people in on it to make them feel better about the offense. Now, my Bible says, Jesus said, he said, if anybody has an offense, he says, when you come to the altar and you present your gift, if you've got an offense towards somebody, this this is what Jesus said. He said, go on Facebook and make a post about it so everybody knows you've got an issue with it. No, that's not what he said, was it? He said, go to them alone, privately, and resolve the offense. The problem is, is we don't take Jesus's solution to dealing with this so what we do is we got and everybody's gonna know i've got an issue mark those that cause division division get this blew me away when i looked at this in the greek disunity two groups well i'm gonna leave and i'm gonna get mad and i'm gonna get more people on my side so now it's my group against their group It brings dissension. It brings disorder. This is what sedition means. It brings sedition. One who wants to incite a rebellion against authority in speech or in writing or in modern day on social media or in speech. The Lord's, I'm telling you what God said. He said, unity means so much to me that if there's anybody doing this, you call them out on it. You call them out. And when they send you a bo- an inbox or a text message or say, hey, let's have coffee. I got a bone to pick. Can you believe? You realize you're hearing their narrative. Right. What you need to say is, have you talked to the pastor about this? Well, I, no. Have you talked to the pastor about this? Then I'm only hearing one side of the story. Come on. I am not going to be part of a sedition in my church. I am not going to partner with somebody that wants to incite a rebellion. And I'm not going to partner with somebody who either by their speech or in their writing is wanting to bring disunity and form two different groups in the church because division is two vision. I'm not going to do this. Unity means that much to me. Even if what you say the pastor or the leader, whoever it is you got mad about, even if they did what you say they did, it's still based on your interpretation of the situation. Let's go together and let's follow what Jesus says. And let's come together with a witness and let's just see. Let's, let's iron this out. The problem is, is most people don't want to iron it out. They want to hold on to their narrative of what they say happened. And God says, take notice. I, I'm being, I, I'm, I got to tell you, this is what he says. They can't be part of the fellowship anymore. Doesn't mean you don't love them. It doesn't mean you don't pray for them. It doesn't mean you don't say hi when you see them out. But once they start to say, hey, come over here. Hey, I got something to say. Nope, I don't want to hear it. It's my church. God's got me here. That's disunity. That's dissension. That's sedition. And I'm not going to, because, 
Well, I'm not going to go there today because I probably already went there. Are you getting this today? Am I telling you the truth today? Am I giving you scripture? Amen? Stand with me.